Well, good evening, community of Phoenix Seminary, members of the faculty, administration, guests, and certainly students. On behalf of the board of directors, I would like to welcome you to the installation of Dr. Hogg as the fifth president of Phoenix Seminary. As a community, we have all sought prayerfully the Lord's guidance to make it abundantly clear who would best serve and lead Phoenix Seminary during this next season. I know it's been a thorough procedure. Most of you wondered, what are we doing for the last nine months when we have the next president right here with us? We did a national search. In fact, we did it twice. But we truly believed in the process that we followed. Thank you, Dr. Hogg, for providing leadership to the seminary during this transition period as we've all worked and prayed through this undertaking. The search committee and the board have spoken with Dr. Hogg extensively, and it has become abundantly clear to all of us that the Lord has called you for such a time as this. And I might add that it was a unanimous vote from the board. As an institution, Phoenix Seminary has been blessed to have Dr. Hogg over these last three years uh, in a number of different roles that he, that he had. And I know he will continue to be, we will continue to be blessed as his service in this new role as president. We will be blessed by his pastoral heart. We'll be blessed for his love for the gospel and theological education, his love for the students, and certainly their spiritual formation and his strong leadership and vision for the future. All of that to say, Dr. Hogg, it is, an, it is it, he is, Dr. Hogg, an exemplary model of what this institution stands for, and that is scholarship with a shepherd's heart. So Dr. Hogg, would you please come towards the, the podium here? It is a privilege and an honor for the entire board, uh, board of directors, myself, to present you with this medallion. And we certainly want to say, may God provide you grace, strength, and wisdom for the time to come. Thank you. The fifth president of Phoenix Seminary. Would you come up and have a, a prayer of dedication for Dr. Hawk? It would be a privilege. Pray with me, will you? Heavenly Father, we gather tonight in the name of your Son. We follow him because we want to honor you. How else could we ever know how we would reflect the beauty of your glory? Lord, I pray for my dear brother. Give him great wisdom, Lord, that he will indeed lead the faculty, the students, our community, Lord, in a scholarship, you know the heart of the school has been a broken heart for a lost world who just, they just don't know the truth. And Lord, if there are not people trained to teach them the truth, how will they ever know? How will their eyes ever be open? So Lord, guide him as he guides the rest of us in scholarship so that we might indeed teach. And in the Lord God and use his example as a shepherd. So indeed, as he guides, it's his example. That's gonna be so powerful upon all of us. And so Lord, we pray you protect his family. Give him the strength. May he always know it's all about you. And you're gonna do something really special through this man. And we are excited to observe it. And we present him to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Appreciate it.
I'd like to announce my retirement. <laughs> it's been wonderful. It's been, it's been fantastic. I hereby announce the search for the sixth president. <laughs> well, when I was a pastor, I was asked if it's difficult to come up with something different to say every Sunday. My answer, though it was longer than this, was essentially not really because it's not up to me. I follow what God has already said in Scripture. In one sense, preaching is thinking God's thoughts after him out loud. But what about speaking at something like this, a presidential inauguration? This task is challenging, especially when I have to follow one of the greats, Andy Westmoreland. Even so, in my own way, what I will lay out for you in the next few minutes is my attempt to once again think God's thoughts after him not as a sermon expounding on Scripture, but as an address mining from Scripture. Having said that, I will admit I do have three points. <laughs> First, I will be ambitious for God's kingdom. Now, it may sound odd that I did not say I will be ambitious for Phoenix Seminary. But you see, I believe that for Phoenix Seminary to thrive, we must set our sights on something other than ourselves. We must set our sights on the kingdom of God. After all, it's not about us. It's about God. It's not about numbers. It's about faithfulness. It's not about self-promotion. It's about partnership. And all of this matters greatly because Jesus told us the world will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. St. Augustine reminded us that sin causes our loves to be misaligned, to be out of order. Jesus, in answering a question, said that our loves will be aligned if we first love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and if we love our neighbors as ourselves. At Phoenix Seminary, loving our neighbor means board members, faculty, staff, and students all loving each other but it also means the community that is Phoenix Seminary loving the local church. To this end, what this means for me is that a key component of my work will include strengthening, building, and sustaining strong church partnerships. After all, every school has to ask itself, who are we choosing to serve? Phoenix Seminary seeks to serve churches who remain faithful to the inerrant word of God as their source of life and godliness. Our school does not exist as an island unto itself, but as an arm of the church. There is, as it were, a spiritually organic connection that must exist for us all, seminary and church, for us all to remain healthy. A seminary that does not exist for the church will produce students who cannot lead or feed God's people. At the end of John's gospel, Jesus called Peter to lead and feed his sheep. Peter passed that charge on to other pastors in the fifth chapter of his first epistle. Paul instructed Timothy in his letters to train up faithful men who could fulfill that charge. Together, our seminary and local churches can fulfill Jesus' call and these apostolic admonitions to raise up men and women for a lifetime of faithful ministry. Now, just as a seminary that does not exist for the church will produce students who cannot lead or feed God's people, so churches that are not partnering with seminaries to raise up future pastors are digging a hole out of which the next generation will struggle to climb. Like you, I have watched churches led by pastors with a poor or faulty theological foundation lead their congregations slowly away from the firm foundation of God's word. But this does not mean that a seminary is solely responsible for scholarship. Thinking on this, I was reminded of a conversation I had with Robert Smith before I left Beeson Divinity School at Samford University. 
I was leaving there to return to full-time pastoral ministry and I sat down with Dr. Smith and I said, what wisdom would you impart to me? A man, definitely my senior, more experienced in so many ways, more godly, walks with Jesus. I think the Trinity is here and he's just underneath. So it seemed wise to ask him, what, what would you pass on to me? What would you say to me? And as I go on to serve this congregation in North Carolina, and he said, he thought for a while, and he said, you know what, I can't speak for them, but as for me, I don't need a plastic pastor. I need a pastor in whom there is a pulse. I need a pastor who will sit with me in whatever situation I find myself. I need a pastor, he said, who will open God's word and turn ink into blood. My first challenge to myself and to every one of you here is that we keep our sights fixed upon the glory of God's kingdom so that we can rightly be ambitious for Phoenix Seminary. Second, I will live with the mindset of abundance. If I am going to work with my focus firmly fixed on God's kingdom, how else could I approach my calling? Despite a culture that surrounds us with pressure to think in terms of scarcity and therefore to think in terms of competition, I believe Christians need to live differently. Consider Jesus' miracle with the five loaves and two fish. The thousands who followed Jesus were beleaguered. They were tired, they were hungry, they were helpless. Like sheep, you can imagine them milling about, wondering what to do, where to go, fretting over what they did not have. The disciples also were worried. They were at their wit's end, sure that poor planning and disaster were gonna fall upon them. And all of this going on amazingly with the very Son of God physically present with them, even in their midst. In other words, the crowd was living with a mindset of physical scarcity and spiritual poverty. And the disciples were living in a mindset of physical scarcity and spiritual poverty. But what does Jesus do? What does he show them? Jesus, the God of all abundance, give thanks to the Father and turns five little buns and a couple of sardines into the greatest feast in history. Perhaps the most amazing thing about this miracle is that Jesus did it not only once, he did it twice. First, Jesus did this in a Jewish context, and after they were finished eating, they collected, you'll recall, 12 baskets of leftovers, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then Jesus did this again, largely in a Gentile context, and what did they gather up? Seven baskets of extra food that couldn't be eaten, representing fullness and completion. In other words, Jesus showed us that his abundance is sufficient for all his people, Jews and Gentiles, together. My second challenge to myself and to every one of you is to join me in keeping your mindset oriented around the abundance Jesus showed us. Quite practically, this means everyone in this room should be perpetually thinking about others because you live in gratitude for Jesus. This is exactly what Paul said in 2 Corinthians when he spoke of generosity. Giving is not about working out if you are worthy of me and my money. Can you imagine where you and I would be if God began with the question, are you worthy of me and my abundance? Praise God, his liberality is based on forgiveness, love, mercy, grace, and kindness. And this is exactly Paul's point. Generosity doesn't flow from me because of what I think of you. Rather, generosity flows from me because of what I think of my Savior and my God. Obviously, for all of, this, all of us, this means we must be vigilant in keeping a Christ-centered, self-effacing, spirit-minded approach to giving. But what does this mean quite specifically for Phoenix Seminary? 
When I think of Phoenix Seminary, this means, among other things, being mindful about outreach as well as inreach. By inreach, I mean continuing to serve the students who come to our campus, whether in person or virtually through online classes. They come to us for training, and we must continue to serve them well by teaching and modeling God's word before them day by day, semester by semester. But by outreach, I mean developing more ways we can assist the church by serving believers who are not our students. Just as an example, we recently started this with our Hispanic Studies program. By developing a certificate program to teach Spanish-speaking Christians in Phoenix the basics about the Bible, theology, and practical ministry. Along the same lines, I'm working on ways we can do that very thing for English-speaking churches who need to train small group leaders but are not able to do this on their own or they could use our help or expertise. Additionally, I would love to host smaller gatherings of 30 or 40 to fellowship around a meal, despite the fact apparently it's supposed to be just coffee, but I'll think about that later. <laughs> we'll fellowship around a meal and then talk and think through important issues of our day and how we can address them together. I could go on, but that would only serve to frighten Jonathan and his operations team more and more as they think through the logistics of all the things I'm adding on to their already busy plate. But lest I incite panic amongst the staff, let me say I want Phoenix Seminary to live out of a mindset of abundance as we fulfill Jesus' great commission in Matthew 28 to make disciples through inreach and outreach. So I will be ambitious for God's kingdom. I will, be, I will live with the mindset of abundance. And finally, I will take time with my Savior. I am no Daniel. So if he needed to pray three times a day, how much more me? In a similar vein, the great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon was reported to have said, every morning I spend at least an hour with the Lord in prayer, except when I'm facing a busy day or a difficult day, then I spend two hours. Thanks, Spurgeon. As impressive as, as impressive as that may be, more importantly, Spurgeon knew he needed partners in prayer. To that end, he had people praying for him during the week and even while he was preaching. So my third challenge to myself and every one of you here is that you would join me in praying diligently and unceasingly for Phoenix Seminary. Pray that God would grant wisdom and discernment. Pray that God would guide and provide for Phoenix Seminary. Pray that God would be honored and glorified in all that we do together. Pray that during my tenure, Phoenix Seminary would grow and develop in all the ways that will find favor in God's sight. In light of this, a statement made by Edmund Clowney, a former president of Westminster Theological Seminary, is worth repeating. He said, it is quite possible to overestimate the gifts you have. It is quite impossible to oversupplicate the gifts you need. In my last meeting with Andy Westmoreland before leaving Samford University almost nine years ago, he said to me, if you ever have the opportunity to become a president, and at the time I thought, why are you telling me this? But he said, if you ever have the opportunity to become a president, think and pray long and hard on that decision before accepting. He said that out of his many years of experience. And that's why when this opportunity came up, it took a week of prayer and conversation before even throwing my hat in the ring. And that's why before being extended and accepting the call six months later, that prolonged period of prayer was even more important. I'm not going to stand here and claim that being president is the hardest job there is, but it is a job that cannot be done well apart from the power of prayer and time spent in solitude with my Savior. 
Bringing this to a close, I'd like to end as I did when I addressed the faculty and staff in December. Since coming here just over two and a half years ago, I have collected a few titles along the way. Professor of Church History, Director of Library Services, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Interim President, President. All of this makes me think of a quote that I read in a book just a few months ago by James Smith. He said, you couldn't have imagined your life, its bends and pivots, its zigs and zags. The crookedness of your unlikely life is not a failure. The wending paths aren't mistakes. The looping route that looked like it was going nowhere was a switchback climbing up a mountain. The jagged line that is your story tracks the, paths, uh, the path of God's companionship and care. Who indeed can straighten what God has crooked, made crooked? And why would you wish it were straighter? Look what God has done. That crooked line is one he drew with you. I don't know what lines we will draw together, crooked or straight, but I know that we will draw them together and God will draw them with us. Our gracious heavenly Father, I give you thanks that you are the one who draws before us the plot line of our lives. You are the one who fills us with your Holy Spirit and grants us gifts from, from your Spirit. You are the one who draws us into your presence. You are the one who transforms us from glory to glory because of the death and resurrection of your Son that has dealt with our sin and death. Oh God, we give you thanks that we can look forward to new creation. We give you thanks for the day when all the shackles of sin shall be gone and we shall see who we are in Christ fully and gloriously, and yet nothing will compare to your glory for all eternity. But Lord, as we look forward to that day, even now we know that we have been left here, we remain here, even through the power and presence of your Spirit, that we might go and prepare others as well, call others as well, walk with others as well, disciple others. So Lord, we pray that you would help us here at Phoenix Seminary, the entire community. Would you draw us together, pastors and churches and donors and board members and faculty and staff and students and others who would walk with us? Lord, would you draw us together and unite us and protect us from the world, the flesh and the devil by the power of your spirit, that we might indeed be a light that shines bright in Phoenix, in Arizona, the Southwest, and the world. Grant, O oh Lord, that we might be a place where your steadfast word remains steadfastly in our hearts. And may we collectively and together come together in the joy of what it is to follow in the footsteps of Christ, that by doing so, whether our lines are crooked or straight, we know that you are the one who has drawn them with us. And for this, we give you thanks. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.